Personally, I was fired from a job in 1978 for being gay, and it was specifically for being gay. Um, they told me I was being fired for being a lesbian, and when I went and tried to get unemployment, I couldn't get it because they said I was fired for homosexuality, so I didn't qualify for unemployment. I would come out to people at Apple. Apple did not have a non-discrimination policy on sexual orientation, and I came out to individuals that I was close with. I'd take them into a conference room. I would tell them I was gay and I had a uh, lover, but please don't tell anybody else. I want to be in control of the information myself. I don't know how people will react. When I was at San Jose State, the, my last year at San Jose State uh, as a student, I, I decided to go racing sports cars. And uh, I remember being at a race and I had driven this one man's car because he broke his leg and he needed his car driven. So I drove the car for him. I was having a conversation with some people and I remember him saying, you know, when I first knew Wigsy, I thought she was one of those. And now I know her, she's such a nice person, she can't possibly be. I didn't see how the connection was there. But that, you know, I, th I remember that to myself. That was a, a, I was so proud of myself of being able to hide uh, and keep you know, my, my personal life secret because it was really pretty frightening to not, to be out. It was actually um, at Stanford, and this would have been um, uh, mid to late 70s, um, LGBTQ people weren't as out as, as people are now. And so once a month, there'd be a little ad in the, in the uh, Stanford Daily, which was a daily newspaper, that would very cryptically talk about getting together. And it was always off campus. Uh, when I came to, to live to San Jose, uh, I realized that the only way to uh, make community, meet community, meet people, friends, uh, anything, even pickups or whatever you wanted, it was the bars. And uh, at the beginning, it was shocking to me because I, I wasn't so used to go to bars in Mexico, but then, uh, of course, then I made friends and start making community. And I saw how important that was because also that was the only option. In the 1970s, the entire gay community was centered in the bars. Everything happened in the bars. If you wanted to meet people, you went to the bars because that was the only place to go to meet people. Um, you have to remember that the gay community was in its infancy. I, yeah, everything was new and exciting and, you know, gay pride was exciting. Everything was new. Um, and so the only place that you could go and feel safe and secure and with your own people was in the bars. And there were tons of gay bars and all the social life was based on that because it wasn't just hanging around in bars. Um, they all had softball teams and there were bowling leagues and there were all these things to do, but all that social life came out of the bars. I bought a Rex Club 45 years ago, 77, does that work out? Yeah. At that time, there were 14 gay bars in San Jose. We were just one and they all were full. People had, you know, Good times. Then we got down to three, and John and I own two. Um, and I've been a privilege to be a part of it. I didn't know what it was when I bought it, but soon learned very quickly of what it was and got very involved in the community. I moved to uh, the uh, Valley in uh, the fall of 76, I uh, came out to go to graduate school and um, I ended up living in East Palo Alto because uh, it was cheap and it was close to Stanford. Um, I was surprised to learn once I moved there 
that on the 1900 block of University Avenue, there were actually two gay bars and a bathhouse, um, you know, in an area that otherwise you would have never expected that. And further, there were a couple of apartment complexes, one of which we uh, called the Homo Heights and one we called Faggot Flats, but they were almost 100% gay and lesbian. When I came out, there were still laws on the books about gay people dancing together. Uh, it, it, you could be arrested for doing it. Uh, gay bars were still being raided for absolutely no reason. It, it was ridiculous. I, the first time I was in a bar and the police came in um, and the lady sitting next to me said, take your ID out, put it on the bar and put your hands flat on the bar, sit there, look forward and do not talk back to them. And the people who didn't do that, who turned around and objected or said, what are you doing? You can't do that. They were all arrested for nothing. And this was in the 70s. But then there was a law in the books that you had to be wearing three pieces of clothing from your own gender. They came in Max Club on a regular basis. And then I found out that they used to do it as a training circumstance because they knew no one would bother them. So they would come in, they would go all the way back, and the worst was a woman, and she would pound on the doors, boom, 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 to the men's restroom. San Jose police, come out. She was terrible, but I won't give her name either. But anyway, that, that was their mode of operandi. And when I heard that later on, um, that hurt me. You know why? And, and they would come in and, and haul the guys out on a regular basis. You look like somebody who uh, robbed a bank. Or were you down by the Bank of America yesterday afternoon? Come out here and they would frisk them one way or the other. And they were used to that and they didn't fight. They didn't cause any problems. Things were a little, we were much more discriminated again against back in those days. So our community was very tight. We had a very tight community. And, you know, I met one of my, my longtime companions. I met that we were together for like 10 years. I met him at a, at a gay bar. And uh, we stayed together for quite a long time. We were very successful. But, but I don't know. It's, it's, it, I think we relied on each other a lot more. We needed each other a lot more. Uh, for many things, jobs, even as far as getting jobs, meeting each other, you know, is finding a husband or a lover. You know, we tighter. That's what I mean by tighter. We needed each other. The broader San Jose community, we didn't, there wasn't a lot for gay people. You know, I mean, there were the bars. And if you wanted to meet other gay people, you had to get your courage up and you had to go to a bar. And for many people, that wasn't ideal. I mean, you know, I barely went to bars when I was, you know, hadn't come out. I was, you know, pretty much a suburban teenage person. And, uh, you know, I had no idea. We wanted to offer an alternative to that. We wanted people to um, be able to call the Billy DeFrank Community Center and get a friendly voice. and learn about all the other options that, you know, you didn't have to go to the bars, that, you know, the center had programs. We had rap groups where you could come and just sit. You didn't have to talk. You know, you could just be there and observe, you know, and watch that cute girl in the corner without feeling like, you know, you had to get drunk to work up the courage to talk to her. Um, yeah, so it, the center was critical to you know, I don't want to put the bars down because for a long time, they were the only game in town. It was the only place that you would meet anyone. Um, but I don't think it was the healthiest alternative. And um, I and a lot of other people, you know, wanted something different. Really spoke to the needs of the community that brought everybody together. It wasn't just, you know, drag queens. It wasn't just you know, leather lesbians. It wasn't just um, people from the bars. 
it was all of us. And we could come together in a place where we could meet each other and work together to, uh, you know, create this camaraderie and uh, community. In fact, the center was a place where they could go and be safe and learn about themselves and become, you know, good citizens. Learn how to be gay and out and proud of it. The biggest thing was the switchboard, and it became a really crucial part of the services that the center offered, because if you were gay in San Jose and you had questions and, you know, you didn't want to go to the bars, but you just wanted to, you know, find out, you know, who you were and, what, you know, get some validation that it wasn't a terrible thing, you could call the center. You could call 293-AGAY, and someone would answer the phone and talk to you. And uh, it was... Um, very important, I think, for a first contact for a lot of people in the community who weren't already involved. You know, it was a tumultuous time. It was the anti-war movement. It was the women's movement, the black students movement, you know, the Latina, Latino movement. I mean, it was a, 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 a heated up time. And so a guy by the name of Paul Wysocki and myself decided we needed to have a student group on campus, a student gay group on campus. And it, it really wasn't difficult in terms of the campus. You know, the, the Associated Students gave us money for a center or for at least a group meeting. And the one thing about it is that I was the one open, out and open gay or lesbian person on the campus. It was like it was, I was the only one, you know, and I knew that wasn't true because I knew people. But still, it was a time when people were very frightened to be out and to be identified. I was working with students and they had the same problems, you know, that coming out was a real difficulty and a real problem. And I think having a faculty member on campus who was out was helpful to them. You know, at least they, and I, and I think it was helpful to other faculty and staff as well, although it didn't, they didn't take advantage of it to come out. But I think that they were less uptight about it. And for the students, it was really important that they have somebody on campus that they could relate to. While I was a grad student at San Jose State in the counseling psych program, um, many of the clients that we served uh, were um, coming to therapy for LGBTQ um, issues and, and coming out issues. Um, and being on campus at that time, um, Wigsy and others were starting, well, not even starting, they were this activism around um, having students be able to have affinity groups on campus um, who could start to speak for their own truth, um, which was not, again, a real supported thing because um, you wanted students to kind of just behave the way they needed to and you kind of move forward. I mean, I remember in grad school, they taught us about the activism at San Jose State during the Vietnam War. And we they used that as examples of like when you're uh, in counseling psych in grad school around what activism looked like then, and what was the role of the social of the therapist back then? So it was very specific around the activism of San Jose State, and I just remember thinking the activism today, at that time, was the work of of, of activists like Wigsy who were starting groups, who were supporting uh, support groups, who were starting to look at advocacy and and the building of affinity groups. And that early days of um, both in, at that time, you know, Chicano and um, Latin groups, student groups, um, were really starting to take hold. In college, there were only a handful of people that, that knew uh, of my multiple identities um, because it was something that was still very new to me. I didn't know uh, what that meant and I was still exploring. And so when I was student body president, I wasn't out. It was not something that I was hiding. It was more so something that I was still exploring and didn't quite know where that would lead. Definitely when I became much more confident, much more sure of who I was through my own self-exploration, uh, that, that I never hesitated to then say and declare who I was because it was such a grounding space for me to be able to say it. Um, it was something that, again, connected me to my own power. My experiences growing up in the Latino community here in San Jose 
um, there wasn't much talk about LGBTQ people. I think the, the moments where I did hear or see them, they were in movies um, or they were in perhaps conversations that I wasn't supposed to hear. And often it was in a whisper or as a joke. And so there weren't many positive representations. It was interesting though, when I came out, uh, there was a lot of fear, um, perhaps not my own, but that was uh, what I was told about or advised, you know, that there might be some challenges, uh, particularly because my parents, um, very religious, uh, you know, immigrant background, um, but I was very much embraced and very much welcome in my family. There was a process of learning and relearning um, together. What we often see in the media, you know, the Latino religious family that um, rejects their child. And I know that happens, but what we don't often see are the very loving and supportive and embracing families choose the journey to learn together. And so I really want to expand that narrative so that we, so that people who are LGBTQ and thinking of coming out know that there are multiple outcomes to that story, not just a tragic one. In 1992, I had been here like five years already, part of this group and this group of friends and, and going to the bars and usually the same one. And uh, I, I met Jaime Alejandro, uh, who was the founder and creator of Pro Latino. And he invited me to this meeting. He said, just said lightly, it's going to be a meeting of friends and we're going to talk about, you know, how to make a little group. And he didn't explain much. But I said, well, it must be fun. Let's go. And uh, we met and that's how Pro Latino all of a sudden was born. Pro Latino was the answer to the lack of services that existed at that time. Some of the information was translated from English to Spanish in a way that was not particularly accurate. It was not culturally competent. And so Pro Latino came to fill that gap that there was in terms of services. And I remember coming to one of the meetings in 1996 when I arrived here, and you would see in this big room 30, 40 people gathering. And the conversations were about different topics, but more than the topic itself, it was the sense of belonging in a place the sense of speaking the same language. And I'm not talking just about speaking Spanish, but culturally, there was a connection that was so important at that time. The biggest challenges in the 70s and 80s of being Asian and gay was finding friends, um, the challenge of loneliness and isolation, um, I'm sure there were instances of uh, mental health stress leading even to suicides because they couldn't resolve their sexuality with either their families or their culture or their religion. The stigma that was there was around um, the fact that if you were gay or identified as gay or were even different um, around your sexuality, that uh, it brought shame to the family. Um, in a Filipino uh, community, it's about family. We are a, a society that um, wants to have lots of children, but, and it, we are very close and tight knit. And if you aren't able to marry and have children, you become an outsider. And beyond that is the pressure around religion you know, to have, you know, the supreme being frowning on you and your life and um, as well as your community thinking that um, you're doing disgustful 
uh, disgraceful things with each other, with other men, um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to, to take. And so many, many of us stayed in the closet for very, very long times. Personally, what I realized that um, I wasn't going to change. I began to realize that there was something valuable and actually beautiful about being who I was, as different as I was. And I think the support of um, friends uh, in the community really made a difference in, um, in, in carrying me through perhaps the, the challenging times. I remember telling my mom, I had come out to her in college, and I remember telling her that one day I hope to be married to another man. Now, this was probably a decade before, you know, uh, decades actually before, you know, uh, legal marriage was available to us. Um, and I remember I've never seen my mom cry, but she broke down in tears in a way that um, still is painful to, to me to think about. But since then, um, she's been, become very accepting, uh, and uh, she even attended our wedding. Uh, my husband and I have been together uh, going on 36 years. When I was around six, I had realized that I had the wrong gender assigned, um, but I didn't have the word gender, and there was no conversation around it, there was no internet, there was no transgender language. So it was something I very much kept to myself. It wasn't really until I was in my late 30s and finding leather community that I first in, ever encountered another trans guy. And when that happened, that completely changed my world. Um, it basically made it so that I couldn't hide from it anymore. And there were at least a couple of words and a couple of people in the world. And so I started uh, doing everything I could to find about transitioning female to male. And there wasn't really much internet then, so it was talking to people. One of the communities that was really important to me was the leather community in the South Bay. One of the uh, important organizations that the leather community worked with was the Imperial Royal Lion Monarchy, which is one of, uh, part of the, the two different uh, Bay Area uh, fundraising organizations that focuses a lot on um, cross-dressing, on uh, queens and kings, and you know, walking down the aisle and being very, very royal. Their main focus was fundraising for all kinds of queer um, resources. People recognize me f not only from the gay community, but I crossed over from the gay community to the middle of the, ro middle of the road and also to the straight community because a lot of people came to the shows in the early um, 70s, 80s. I was the imperial crown prince. Not princess, I was a prince. So I... I I was a prince for a long time and went to all the different coronations from San Jose to San Francisco and I went to Reno, to Stockton. I went to all the coronations all over and traveled with them. Uh, first, I was just doing it as Diamond John with a, with a glittery sport coat and, and all the glitz and everything and tons of stuff. Then once I became involved with the Empress of San Jose, Akatana, who put me in drag, then I did all the coronations in drag. Then they knew me as, they still knew me as Diamond John because I didn't choose a drag name because I didn't want to confuse people who I am. So I wanted people to know that I'm always Diamond John whether I'm wearing whatever or a dress or Levi's or whatever, I'm Diamond John, I'm the same guy. I just look different. We supported and I say we, the dry community, we supported the leather functions and the leather functions supported us. So we became a family. We, the leather community and the dry community became a family. Really started Carla's out of a need for a lot of cross-dressers needing a place to kind of get their hair done. 1985, there wasn't a whole lot of 
the, the word transgendered actually hadn't even gotten into the lexicon yet. So creating this safe place where people could come and be their authentic selves really stuck with quite a few people. And it was very much an underground community. It wasn't um, the group other than the, the drag queens. People really didn't see a whole lot of this community. Um, you know, they weren't marching in pride. They weren't participating in any of that social event. So she started out doing people's hair and, and that sort of stuff. She did their makeup. She was a cosmetologist. So she kind of did all of that. And from there grew the piece of having lockers for people to hold their items. They could come in and get dressed and keep their stuff there privately. Then came the store where it was adding product where they could buy shoes in their own sizes um, because they have a tendency to wear larger shoe sizes, uh, breast forms, other articles that are needed for that sort of stuff. The interesting thing about Carlos is that we're one of the oldest organizations that do what we do in the country. We're also one of the few, we're actually the only one on the West Coast that's actually owned by somebody who's of the community. The decision to come out is a very personal thing. And for me, it was a very personal decision. I chose to come out because from my perspective, it was either I choose to come out or I choose depression, I choose anxiety, I choose not living my life. I choose, I ultimately choose no longer living. For me, being able to come out was the most liberating experience, but a lot of people mistake that as being selfish. So when you look at family members, when you look at friends, it, people think it's a very selfish act when it's a very, a lot of times for folks, it's the most bravest thing you could do. It takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of courage to be able to come out and live authentically. So the challenge I was met with, uh, being able to do it at the workplace, a lot of folks saw that as courageous. A lot of folks also found it confusing. <laughs> they didn't know what transgender meant. They didn't know what it meant. I just was able to say who I am, this is who I am, and I'm, I, I don't need you to know what it's like to be transgender. I just need you to know that I'm going through a human experience and I need as much support as I could get. And those that were most supportive were able to say, what can I do to support you? Um, in terms of family members, um, even my own partner at the time thought it was the most selfish thing I could ever do. And it just layered on to this prioritizing myself over my family. Uh, with friends, it's prioritizing kind of like myself over the value of friendship, right? It's, it's deemed as a very selfish act when what the world needs to realize is that people that come out, it's the most courageous act that they could do. First, I volunteered at the Community Health Partnership and um, with Jen Shockey, who is another person I, that um, helped start the Trans Empowerment Program, which was the first county funded program for trans people, in particular trans women of color, that I founded with her and with support from funds from the Minority AIDS Initiative that came through Miss Joanne Keatley, who also worked in Santa Clara County way before me. The story of trans people in Santa Clara County is a very complicated one. And I think a lot of us survived through engaging in survival sex work, engaging in living lives as cisgender women, because that's what we were told to do by the medical profession back then, um, the psychological institutions that existed. Um, insisted that we erase our pasts in order to move forward. And many of us did. Many of us burned pictures of us as children. The community has struggled and a lot of people have been successful and are thriving. I don't want to make it sound like this is a sob story because it's not. It's a story of resilience and survival and strength. And the only way for us to move forward in Santa Clara County is together. Violence against trans people is still really high and suicide rates amongst trans people are still really high. A lot of it due to that isolation and 
abuse that occurs in the home as well as in school. A lot of kids still have a really tough time. When Gwen Arujo was murdered, that had a really huge impact on all of us in Silicon Valley. As I look at um, kind of the social life and the kind of the integration of cultures in our social life here in the Valley, I think that there was, especially in the early days, a real separation of our groupings um, where you just didn't hang out with um, different cultures or dif different ethnic groups, different races, it just didn't happen. And so when you start to look at, for me, when I start to look at like, what were those dividers? I think there was dividers of language, definitely of culture, of education, of economic levels, um, and of acceptability. We felt like we should stay to our own um, because at least that was safer or felt more comfortable when you were already ex um, going through an anxious and, and, and troubling time. I had been involved in uh, county politics uh, in the late um, 70s. Uh, in 1979, I was working for a county supervisor. And uh, it was at that uh, time that they were debating whether to pass an ordinance making it illegal to discriminate against uh, LGBTQ people in housing and employment. Uh, at this point, there was no protection at the state level, uh, no protection certainly at the, at the federal level. And so it was happening at the city level. And any number of cities had done this. One of the most well-known was Miami-Dade. So in, in 1979, the county then passes these, as does the city. And um, as ha it happened elsewhere, the religious right sort of emerged out of nowhere. A lot of it sort of led nationally by uh, uh, people uh, like uh, Anita Bryant um, and, uh, and folks like her. And so they were able to catch, to, to get enough signatures to not have the ordinances take effect. And so they put them on hold until there was a vote in the affirmative to be able to uh, have these ordinances uh, pass. And it was a terrible campaign. Uh, this was, there were two measures for the city and the county, measures A and B, and um, uh, just, just, awful, hateful things said about uh, gay people. I mean, their, their main pitch line was, don't let it spread. You know, they're sort of coming after your children. We cannot sort of give them these type of protections. And so the ordinances went down uh, in, in flames. Uh, uh, two thirds of the, uh, the voters in San Jose and the county uh, didn't think there should be any protections at all. And so even though there was the beginning of a um, a small sort of gay rights movement uh, that was happening in San Jose and Santa Clara County. This totally put a stop to it. Uh, elected officials were nervous about uh, showing any sort of support, especially when they were seeing that two thirds of the people didn't want any support for gay people. Um, and so it was a very difficult time. I mean, it was really um, out in the wilderness uh, for LGBTQ people and we were very disorganized and nobody quite knew what to do. We went to the city council or to the board of supervisors to pass some legislation about not discriminating against gays. And uh, the religious right was there. And they were, you know, they were pretty awful, frankly. Uh, the kind of comments that they were making, they've always come out with these really stupid comments about uh, the gay community being a little crazy and stuff like that. Well, I was walking down the aisle back up the aisle after having addressed this, the Board of Supervisors, and this guy had this placard, and he was starting to go like he was going to hit me with it. And I just looked at him, and I said, oh, I really want to invite you to hit me with that. You know, I, it would be really a good thing for you to do, because you're going to end up in jail after you've done that. And anyway, we had this contentious sort of thing, and he kind of pulled back. Um, but the the minister that was part of that South Hills, big South Hills church, came to me and said, I want, can I talk with you? I'd really like to understand this more. So he came over to see me at the university and we had a long talk. Um, I was a really nice man, nice guy, uh, but just couldn't get 
the notion that we were okay. You know, there was nothing wrong with us, and he wanted to help us out. Uh, in 1984, there was uh, legislation at the state level that would then give gays and lesbians protection um, uh, throughout the state. And uh, our local uh, assembly member, Alistair McAllister, wrote a uh, op-ed in the Mercury News saying that the governor should veto it because gay people just didn't deserve any rights at all. They were just so contemptible that they didn't have, they shouldn't get any civil or legal or moral rights at all. And so when I read that, I said to myself, well, if I don't um, come out publicly to everybody and sort of fight for my rights, that um, nobody else was going to do it for me. And so a week later then, uh, in the Mercury News, I had my rebuttal to what the assembly member said. And um, it was my way of sort of entering um, a gay politics with a, with, with a big splash. And then that allowed me to start doing LGBTQ politics in a way that I couldn't before. And so met up uh, with Wigsy Sievertson, who I didn't know well, but certainly knew, knew of her. And um, we decided we needed to start our own group, because there wasn't any group at that point, um, to begin sort of that long climb back up that we could then have some political clout in San Jose and Santa Clara County. We came up uh, with the name Bay Area Municipal Elections Committee, uh, or BAMEC. Uh, a lot of that was because you know we did a lot of mailing and people were still so closeted that they, you, you couldn't use the word LGBTQ, gay, lesbian, um, in your name because it couldn't be on the envelope. And so uh, we came up with Baymec and uh, almost 40 years later, it still uh, is a name that resonates uh, uh, throughout the political world. We decided that there needed to be an organization that could address these issues without forcing people to, um, to change their minds. You know, we tried to gently lead them along, if you will. And when we had people who would support us, you know, we were very praiseworthy of it, but it was, it was hard because, it, you know, being supportive of gay people was not exactly a good thing for p politicians to do at that time. Um, and so when we had our first, you know, Baymac ultimately went on and had, you know, several dinners like at the Fairmont and places like that. But our original dinner was in the basement of Mitty High School. It was a sub spaghetti feed, you know, with potluck kind of stuff. And the only elected person that would come was Iola Williams. Um, she was the only one that would that would dare to cross the, the threshold of gay world versus white straight world. Um, but little by little, more and more people began to to see that we had one growing power and influence. We collected money. Baymac, you know, raised money to give to candidates. Uh, who were running for office to support candidates to, you know, pressure you know people into developing policies and procedures that would protect the community, uh, and that's that's really why we started Baymac because we needed to have a voice and it had to be not something that we were throwing mud at them, but really holding their hands and helping them across the river, uh, you know, from from their uneducated place. Uh, to being more educated and more knowledgeable of what really the gay community was about. I was fortunate to meet a couple of extraordinary people. One was Ken Yeager and the other was Wigsy Sievertson. And Ken and Wigsy were the supreme gay leaders of the South Bay. They were it for Santa Clara County and San Jose and you know, all of the area around Silicon Valley. And they were incredibly clever in that they didn't allow, it's one of the very few places that national organizations did not swoop in and sort of put their footprint over the top of the local organization. Ken and I were, were, were a very odd couple, we, but we spent hours together you know, we'd, we'd go and we'd go to various and sundry things and then we'd come home, get on the phone, talk about how it went, you know. And one of the things about Ken that I have always appreciated, he's so smart and so organized, and I'm so not organized. So in essence, you know, Ken became the brains of Baymac and I became the mouth. 
you know, because I, uh, he was much shyer then than he is now. The biggest challenges for Vamek was to uh, have enough influence that people would carry legislation that would protect us. And, and developing that kind of relationship took a lot of work, a lot of work. I mean, Ken and I went to more rubber chicken dinners than we will ever, ever want to talk about again, uh, just so we could be there and meet people. And once when people met us and talked with us and other people in our community, they began to realize that, wow, these people aren't so weird after all. Baymec was much more tuned in to how do you relate to middle America? And that was one of the lessons I learned. At that point, when you were gay, you, got, you had a choice politically of sort of either identifying quite left, uh, which is fine. I mean, there's tons of very important and good policies there. But if you were even slightly conservative or grew up in a center to modestly right home, you know, your only choice was the log cabin Republicans. And Baymac was an organization that was extremely relatable. I remember the mayor, Susan Hammer, and other political officials, it was within their therapeutic range to understand a Baymac. There was lots and lots of reasons in those days to be radical and to throw blood and to be rageful and angry. But there's also a political technique and style that um, needed to be used, frankly, in, in a place like Silicon Valley and, frankly, what was honestly an agricultural area. The big turnaround for the gay community uh, in the South Bay after the defeats of, of Measure A and B was, uh, oddly enough, uh, Prop 64, which was the Lyndon LaRouche um, AIDS quarantine initiative. Uh, this was a huge threat um, to our community, particularly gay men, uh, uh, really uh, pretty much at the height of the, of the AIDS epidemic and scare. And um, Lyndon LaRouche uh, wanted to take sort of advantage of this, um, of this political atmosphere um, to maybe launch a presidential um, uh, campaign. And so he collected signatures uh, to put this on the a, a ballot in um, 1986. And because Baymic was the only political organization, we sort of thought that we would be the ones that would do the organizing down here in the South Bay, rather than having it all done in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And so we were able to really um, coalesce our very fractured uh, community with uh, one particular you know, goal, which was to raise money and educate people about Prop 64. And um, we were able to um, defeat it statewide um, at even a higher rate here in Santa Clara County. So our work certainly paid off. It was in 1992 when I was uh, teaching at San Jose State in the political science department that I realized that some of the transfer students from our community colleges weren't doing as well as those that were enrolling as freshmen. And so that uh, created an interest in the community colleges um, and wondering if there was any way that I could help uh, work with those students who were kind of come to a four-year university. And that really then gave me the spark to run for the community college board. If I was able to win, I'd be the first openly gay elected official to any, to any uh, position in Santa Clara County. And for me, who had been involved in politics for so long, I thought it was really important that we would finally have a first openly gay person that then would lead the way for other people to run as well. Our first case was actually diagnosed in 1983. We didn't know that much. Um, there was no test for it at that time. There were no real services, but we knew people were getting 
sick and dying um, very soon after they started to see the first signs. Again, there was no test for HIV. So it was a death sentence back then. It was, on average, they lived maybe nine to 12 months after they began having those symptoms. So it was, it was horrible. Um, it, over time, um, it became known, I think, in the, in the uh, community that if you had a test at the clinic and you came in to get your result and I was in the room, then it was probably going to be a positive test. Eventually, other people were trained to give, their, give that positive test. But there was nothing, nothing really to offer at whatsoever. And that, was, that was what was so hard. And on a personal note, um, which was hard at the same time, is that my partner, um, Gary, who lived with me down here in this very house where I am today, was diagnosed with HIV um, in 1984. At the time, we were living in San Francisco. And um, we both tested, and he tested positive. And it was just heart-wrenching. Anyway, over time, he, did, he was diagnosed with AIDS, um, got very sick over the time, subsequently passed away in 1992. In the mid 80s and into the late 80s, AIDS, uh, it was unknown how at first it was transmitted. And even as the science came out that it had to be transmitted by exchange of body fluids or by needle use, whether licit or illicit, that we, we didn't know whether, for example, touching each other or hugging each other might transmit it. And there was a lot of fear associated with that. And even as uh, the CDC came out with information that you could not give AIDS by hugging another person or shaking their hands or touching a surface that they had touched before or them handing you a piece of food to eat or fruit to eat, that you could still uh, be safe. So that knowledge was still a fear factor even into the late 80s that I recall. You had to be very careful not to write AIDS in the clinic notes itself. There were concerns about privacy, and the, the laws hadn't been firmed up yet, so we could not actually write the diagnosis of AIDS or HIV-related disease at that time in the, in the charts themselves. We could write what the infections were, uh, but I remember there was a, a, a lot of, felt like a lot of secrecy around this, and that made it very unusual to, to take care of folks having these various infections uniformly tended to be young men, uh, and uh, there were very little, I, re I can recall almost no family visits or friend visits. They were very uh, isolated and alone, and uh, it turned out that they were uh, all gay men, um, folks of all color. So there were uh, whites and blacks, um, Latinos, Puerto Ricans, um, um, I'm sure there was even an occasional Asian or, or certainly a Pacific Islander male. So there was this isolation in terms of what we could or could not write in the chart, but also the, the, uh, the social isolation that these folks were suffering. In the mid 80s to late 80s, we were struggling with not having enough blood. The blood contamination uh, uh, because of um, IV users, um, AIDS in, in, in the blood, and being able to give blood uh, not only to hemophiliacs, um, to AIDS patients themselves who needed blood because of their, their treatments and their, their uh, anemic and, and just hemoglobin so low and, and, and just needing blood. And um, there's, uh, at that time, um, they would have been called blood sisters. And these were uh, lesbians who saw that their, um, their boys needed to be taken care of. And they mobilized um, themselves, and then they mobilized their own mothers and other, other women to give blood. And uh, it is because of the lesbians that we were able to increase our, our blood supply. The AIDS crisis really brought our community together. Um, Women generally have, have been more of the caregivers, um, and so many men were sick and dying and uh, sort of e 
unable to sort of help themselves or they had lost friends. And so you really saw, um, again, women and, 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 and lesbians coming together, um, helping out, uh, donating money, uh, getting involved in, in ERAS and all of the aid service organizations that were, uh, that were being uh, created. At this point, um, this, the, the need was greater than the services, and so um, I went before the, the County Board of Supervisors, along with Wigsey Sievertson and others, in uh, 1986, and said we needed money um, for ERAS, which had just been formed, um, and to provide uh, really needed services, particularly on, on, in housing, um, for people who were who were sick and certainly those who were who were dying, and so the um, the Santa Clara County AIDS Task Force then was formed, and uh, I was named chair, and uh, we were then really able to uh, come up with the programs that we needed m most to be funded um, over the next um, several years. AIDS was a terrible tragedy, and it still is, but it got people to come out of the closet, and it got a lot of straight people who didn't know any gay people who thought that we were just a bunch of sex deviants to see that we were dealing with health issues, we were taking care of each other, we were a family. And I think it let people who otherwise wouldn't know become aware of the gay community and what it was like. When I am able to get elected to the Board of Supervisors uh, in 2006, I really wanted to make sure that uh, we continued on with uh, our commitment uh, to HIV AIDS. Um, I was able to get the board to uh, approve um, uh, $6 million over four years, um, telling people ab ab about uh, Truvada, about the ways that they could uh, not get infected um, with HIV, that there were ways to protect yourself and, and your partner. Supervisor Yeager led the creation of Getting to Zero, which is an initiative that is based on a, on a global initiative by UNAIDS that seeks to bring to zero the number of people living with HIV, people facing a stigma related to HIV, and the number of new HIV infections. And that was the overall goal. In the first year, we created, we developed a web series, telenovela, soap opera, to talk to folks about the importance of using PrEP. Con ustedes no se puede. Es donde cargo mi pastilla de PrEP. ¿Pastilla de PrEP? ¿Pero qué estás enfermo qué? No, ni quiero estarlo. PrEP significa pre-exposure prophylaxis. Es una pastilla que tomas a diario para prevenir que te infectes del VIH. In the second time, we received funding to develop a play to address all these sociocultural factors that influence on someone's behavior that puts them at risk for HIV. I started getting involved in polit politically. There was some, a some very punitive AIDS initiative that was on the ballot, and I, I got involved in fighting it. And I thought, oh, I'll do fundraising amongst all the rich, apathetic gay people I know at Apple. Um, and I realized I didn't know any. I knew like two gay people at Apple because no one was out of the closet. And so in 1986, after talking to, HR and talking to legal and talking to, you know, a bunch of people in the company. I started Apple Lambda was the name of it, uh, the gay employees, gay and lesbian employees organization. We made a commitment to ourselves very early on that we were going to work with the company to change policies, to get their support for things that were important to us, to get a non-discrimination policy. The first challenges I faced was talking to human resources and having them say, look, we have nothing against our gay employees, and if there's a problem, we should come to us. But 
an organization like this? Why do you need an organization? Why do you have to drag our name into it? One key lesson I learned at Apple is I had to be absolutely willing to walk out the door uh, in order to help achieve this change at the company. And I was perfectly willing to do so. Um, I simply said that if the policies do not change for LGBT people here, then I can't stay. I cannot stay morally. Uh, I simply cannot stand on this ground. What we did at Apple, and, and we got some early good results at Apple, um, and then it spread through Silicon Valley because the companies were in competition and they learned and, and also shared best practices. So suddenly everybody had a non-discrimination policy and everybody was doing domestic partner benefits. Some of them may have beat us, some of, we may have beat some of them, I don't remember, but it spread through Silicon Valley. And <clears throat> really, to be honest, um, some of the companies put pressure on the state to have a non-discrimination policy. They were beginning to find out that not only was obviously putting in policies that were helpful to the gay employees, that made things more fair and equitable for the gay employees, helped them attract gay employees, but it also helped them attract a lot of other people who just thought these things were important. So four gay employees in the company, hardly anybody was out to their work group, to their managers. Um, it simply was perceived as uh, something that you would be hurt by in, in your job or career at the company. So nobody, I mean, very, very few people came out um, to um, their, their group. Um, we actually ran a survey um, of, of gay employees. We had a distribution list uh, for the GLEN uh, network. And we sent out a survey to all the people on the distribution list asking what it was like. Uh, were you out? Uh, did you experience discrimination? You know, those kinds of things. And it was not a pretty picture. When I joined the company, there was a informal uh, social organization for gay employees that was simply met at people's houses, had social events, and uh, was not approved by the company and was uh, unknown to the company, which was our, which wasn't true. They knew very well what we were doing, but to work with the company within the company and to get change, we had to change it from a social organization to a more business-like organization. And that's when we started this organization, GLEN for Gay and Lesbian Employee Network. We made a request to the management of the company to implement policies on sexual orientation, non-discrimination, non-discrimination uh, on employment, hiring, um, uh, promotion, pay, and they didn't have any of that. The CEO gave me a call one day and talked about, you know, acknowledging that we made the request, and he brought it up to executive. Uh, his executive council, and it was unanimously disapproved. That was it, unanimously. My goodness, what, am, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? So I requested um, access to his executive managers. Well, when we met with each of them, we created readers' theaters for each of these managers from employees in their own section of the company, the company they managed. Um, and what it was, was five or six employees standing up in front of uh, these managers and their management teams and talking about what it was like to work for Hewlett Packard as a uh, gay, lesbian, uh, uh, bisexual, um, and what the policies meant and what a uh, non-discrimination non policy would mean to us and to others. Um, and they listened very intently. And after all of this is done and another delay, um, I got another call from Lou, Lou Platt, come see him in his office. And this is the second and only calls I got from him <laughs> while I was at the company. So I go, go to the, his office 
And he said it was unanimously approved. And I was then assigned to help create the policy and all the associated pieces that go with the policy. One week later, IBM announced the same policy. I think what became very clear to us is that, you know, if you really want to change the law and policies for LGBTQ people, just change businesses and corporations because politicians take way too long. Gay Pride celebrations were extremely important because it was a chance for people to understand, to see and understand how many gay people there are out there. I used to hear all the time when I was young um, from my coworkers or whoever, uh, well, I don't know any gay people. And it, my answer was, well, yes, you do. You just don't know that they're gay because they're not out. Going to Gay Pride, there's this huge crowd of people. They're all just like you, um, and you get you get to go and and hang out with everybody all day, and feel safe, and enjoy yourself. And it was a way to let the world at large know that there are lots of us. We literally are everywhere. Pro Latino became the father group or mother group, whatever we want to call it now, uh, of other Latino groups that were created later. Uh, through organizations, they were not part of Pro Latino, but Pro Latino was the model. Uh, for example, there was a group uh, for youth only, and it was called Youth de Ambiente, and there was an English-speaking Latino group, and it was called Entre Hombres, funny enough, but the name was in Spanish, but <laughs> it was for English speaking. So there were other groups that started being uh, you know, created, but the model was pro-Latino. So we created Teatro Alebrijes, which is an ensemble theater that seeks to elevate the voices of LGBTQ individuals who speak Spanish. Being gay in, in the Silicon Valley, being Latinx, being immigrant, being uh, bicultural, bilingual. I think that adds a lot to the fabric of this larger community. People get to hear stories that they were not used to hearing. They also have that opportunity to interact and get closer to those experiences that are usually hidden by mainstream. We feel that the work that we do by being present, it's very important in changing the minds and, and also expanding the narratives that were once created for us. Now with the work that we do, we feel empowered to change those narratives to create our own stories the way we have lived. This is uh, the first wedding for, uh, for all of us up here, so glad to have you with us. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like us to take a brief moment to briefly reflect <coughs> upon this historic occasion. Let us all remember the hundreds of thousands of gay men and lesbians over the centuries whose love was not recognized or valued by society and thus not allowed to be nurtured or to grow. One of the biggest battles we had was the fight for marriage equality. Uh, certainly, um, polls had shown that the public uh, did not support gay marriage by overwhelming majorities. And so it really took a, a lot of action over a, a lot of years to be able to change that. And I should say, one of the reasons why public opinion finally did change was that so many uh, people were coming out and, um, and introducing their partners, their same-sex partners, uh, to their family and friends. And so people began to sort of slowly support the idea of gay marriage, but certainly not to a point where it was enough.
what an immense honor it is for me personally to officiate over the marriages of Richard and David and Ronnie and Hannah. This is a day I have fought and hoped for over the last 25 years. I will invite each couple to step forward one at a time to exchange their vows and rings, and when both are finished, I will pronounce them married under the laws of the state of California. Finally, when they uh, um, allowed um, a gay marriage in, uh, in, in San Jose, Santa Clara County, California, um, it, was such, it was such a big deal. Um, you know, it was just uh, a, a day that I think everybody will remember. Uh, I remember people sort of lined up uh, at the county building, uh, um, uh, finally wanted to get married. Uh, I conducted uh, the first um, um, uh, two men, two women um, marriages uh, at, at, at the county building. Um, we raised the gay flag, um, and, uh, and actually on that day, we had more people get married uh, we, than, than ever before on a single day in Santa Clara County. So there was just a lot of rejoicing and glad that we were finally uh, able to, to jump over that hurdle that I, I think really has uh, brought so much acceptance um, and acknowledgement uh, to, to gay people in general, but also uh, everything about our relationships. <laughs> Now that, now that you have joined yourselves in solemn matrimony, may you strive all of your lives to meet this commitment with the same love and devotion that you now possess. By virtue of the authority vested in me as a deputy commissioner of civil marriage, I now pronounce you married under the laws of the state of California. And the county, uh, to its credit, had a history of, of doing health assessments in several of our minority communities. But I knew that we had never done one for the LGBTQ uh, community. And I was certainly uh, very much aware, certainly with my academic training, that you really need to have, have data to be able to show that there's a particular need um, before you can sort of say, now I want money to be able to create a new policy. And so um, I then announced that we would be doing this um, a health, a health survey uh, in 2013, um, done by the county um, with some, some contract work. And then by the end of that year, it was done. And it just sort of revealed staggering uh, information about the poor services that were available uh, for LGBTQ people, that so many of them didn't exist, uh, that the needs were, were so high. Certainly something that a lot of us knew, but now we really had proof. And so um, that really has been the guide for the, the county um, ever since then, as far as uh, coming up with programs and services to serve our community. So we created the uh, Office of LGBTQ Affairs, uh, the only one of its type um, in the uh, only type of county in the nation. This county has a long tradition of working to eliminate disparities among its residents. And so my motion, finally, uh, is to uh, direct the county executive's office to report back uh, to the Board of Supervisors at its May 12th 2015 budget workshop regarding preliminary consideration for County Executive's Office of LGBT Affairs. Thank you. You know, it's interesting to think that of what we have created or what we have accomplished in just five years of having the Office of LGBTQ Affairs in the County of Santa Clara. There have been many small victories and points of awareness like flag raisings, like having a logo that has the rainbow uh, overlay on it. Subtle ways that we let our community know that we see them, that we value them. We've also had some infrastructural changes, some big resources that didn't exist before. We now have New Haven Inn, which is an LGBTQ focused transitional housing a program that does not allow folks to enter back into homelessness once they are in the program. We have a gender health center that addresses the needs of trans, non-binary, gender expansive uh, members of our community and able to access medically necessary services. We now have uh, different trainings. We've 
invested over half a million dollars in LGBTQ focused training across the lifespan from early education to adult services uh, that are now accessible and we're building a stronger capacity within our public accessible system. When I think about what we're doing now is we're setting a foundation for every member of our community, our LGBTQ young folks, our aging adults, our families, to know that Santa Clara County is a place that they can call home and we want them to stay here and thrive safely. In order for us to be able to build more community and have more people be accepted who they are, we have to find a way to create community for those that don't find community here. But we need more leaders to be able to build these spaces. Uh, we need more brave voices. And what I wanna see here, if we're gonna ensure that we have a vibrant community is not only think about the LGBTQ community as one piece, but many different intersecting, um, diverse, beautiful pieces all together. The one thing that is really important to me is for us to address the issues of discrimination. And, you know, you can talk about discrimination against gays, but for me, the problem was not only against gays, it was about the way women are treated, the way black students were treated, the way, you know, Latina, Latino students were treated. The whole issue of discrimination, if you, if it's okay to discriminate against one person, then it's okay to discriminate against everybody. And one of the things when Ken and I, started Baymac, you know, we had, a, we had a commitment that it wasn't just about the gay community, that we had to always be conscious of discrimination against other groups.